Okay, what questions you guys have this morning? So we've got d squared s dt. So that's the second derivative of position with respect to the time is equal to minus k. And the s dt equals 44 uh, when and S of t equals zero when t equals zero. So we can solve this initial value problem. I've got two initial values because I have two derivatives. So each derivative will solve for one of the c's when I anti-differentiate. Okay. So when I anti-differentiate the second derivative the first time, I will get the first derivative with a constant that's unknown. So the antiderivative of minus k is minus kx. That would be the antiderivative of just minus k. And so this is this is s prime of t. Or sorry, not x. I've got a t here because t is my variable. So minus kt would be my my first derivative. But I always have a c on antidifferentiation. I don't know what that constant is yet, but we will eventually figure out what it is. Um, and so if my first derivative is this, the original function, the position function would be the antiderivative of that, which is gonna be minus k uh, t squared over two plus ct plus, let's call this c1, and then we'll call this one c2. So that's c1. So I will have two constants from anti-differentiation here. Okay. When t is zero, we're told that the position is zero. So s of zero equals zero, which is equal to, well, when I plug t equals zero and that's zero and that's zero, and so that's c2. So c2 is gonna be zero. And if c2 is zero, and I know that the first derivative is 44 when t is zero, I know that s prime at zero is equal to 44 is equal to minus k times zero plus c1. So that tells me that c1 equals 44. So now I have my position, my actual position function s of t is minus k t squared over two plus 44 t and then plus zero, which I probably won't write down because it's plus zero. So that's the first thing, was to solve for s. So we can put in 
minus k. T to the second of a carrot to the second divided by two. plus 44 T. Yep. Um, I want it in there. Go away. And then uh, when is the the derivative zero. So we want to figure out solve uh, minus kt plus 44 equals zero. So that's going to be t equals 44 over k. And then when S is 242, for the value of T found in step two, okay. Right now, all we're doing is just pushing out algebra, which let's finish pushing out algebra and then we'll talk about the problem. Um, Cause interpreting what's going on in this problem probably makes things easier, but we can just do it with strict algebra right now. So I'm gonna plug this T value into S and pretend that I get uh, 242 out. So S of uh, 44 over K is supposed to equal, uh, 242, and we want to know which k value makes that happen, right? So we're going to plug that into this, and I'm going to get uh, minus k over 2 times 44 over k squared plus 44 times 44 over yeah, that K and that K will cancel. Or one of these will, there'll still be one down there, right? Uh, let me undo that because that makes it look like they both cancel. Anyway, let's write this out. I'm gonna have a minus, I'm gonna have a 44 squared. I'm gonna have a two and I'm gonna have a K in the denominator because this K is gonna cancel with one of those two Ks, right? There's two Ks inside the parentheses. Well, there's two Ks because of the parentheses and the exponent, one of them is gonna cancel. So when I've done with all of that, one of them is gonna be in the denominator. There's gonna be a two in the denominator. There's gonna be two 44s in the numerator. There's gonna be a minus sign. Plus I'm gonna have 44 squared over K still. So what does this say? This says take 44 squared over K and take away half of the exact same thing. So I should just have half of 44K, 44 squared over K. Okay. And this is supposed to be equal to 242. So I can solve this. And when I solve this, I get uh, 44 squared over k equals uh, 484 because I've moved the two over and that's equal to four times 121, which is equal to four times 11 squared. This is equal to 16 times 11 squared over k. So the 11 squareds are gonna cancel. If I move k over to this side, I will get 16 equals 4k, which tells me that k equals 4.
multiply 242 times 2. Because that's the number the problem gave us here. Any questions just about the, yeah. So our first derivative expression You're, you're talking here. Um, right here. Up in the second half of part one. It says the second derivative is minus K with constant K with first derivative equal to 44. And then with position zero when t is zero. So all of these things happen when time is zero. Is that? Yeah, I, the English is a little weird there, but I interpreted it to mean that all of these three things are happening when time is equal to zero. Otherwise, it, it didn't really make much sense otherwise. Other questions on this? Okay, so let's look at the actual like word problem part. So we're driving along a highway at a steady uh, speed of 44 feet per second. We see an accident, we slam on the brakes, and we want to know what constant deacceleration is required to stop the car in 242 feet. To find out, we're going to follow these steps. So we don't know what the acceleration is that I need. I know that my current speed is 44 and my current position, I'm gonna call that zero so that the accident, which is 242 feet away, we can measure that as just a positive distance. So where I am when I see the accident is position zero. The time when I see the accident is time zero. I'm moving 44 feet per second and I wanna know what deceleration or what acceleration I have to make to hit the brakes in time or to have the car stop in time. And so what we do is we we figure out, well, I want the velocity to be to be zero. And to do that, I need some sort of an acceleration. And it's going to depend on which acceleration which gives me T. So we solve that for the t, the time that it's going to take, uh, no matter what the acceleration I use, is going to be 44 divided by that acceleration is how long it's going to take me to stop. Right. So if I accelerate slowly, that smaller denominator is going to make this take longer to stop. If I accelerate hard or, or brake hard, it will take me a shorter amount of time to stop. Yeah. Sixteen. Oh, um, so forty-four squared is four times eleven squared. So I did the four squared and I did the eleven squared. So no matter what my acceleration is, it's going to take me forty-four over that acceleration seconds to stop. So that was that second part. And after that, I know how long it's going to take me to stop. I need the position when I stop to be 242 or less, right? So as long as I stop at 242, I'm going to be good. If I break harder than that, I will definitely be good. So I have to break at least as hard as four feet per second per second. If I do better than that, I will stop sooner. But if I break at four feet per second per second, I will just barely tap whatever the accident is and not actually hit it, right? 
So does that make sense in this problem? And how the the math is interpreted into the sense of the problem? Okay. Other problems you guys want to talk about today? Okay, so I'm going to write everything's in sines and cosines. So got one over sine. Like this. And to simplify this, I'm going to multiply everything by the sine of theta. So if I multiply the top and the bottom by sine theta, I will end up with the integral of one's just going to be in the numerator, right? And in the denominator, I will have one minus sine squared. It's another name for one minus sine squared. And then what's another name for one over cosine squared? And a function that gives me a derivative of secant squared is tangent. So I should get tangent of theta plus c. Kind of one hint for some of these trig ones is if you can break it down to write everything's in sines and cosines, that's usually a good place to see like what do I actually have. Dealing with all six trig functions sometimes can be a little overwhelming. If you're only going to ever deal with sines and cosines, that makes things easier sometimes. Inside. Is it on the inside? On all of them, there's nothing on the outside? Okay, because on the outside, that would be tougher. Um, so it's just gonna stay eight theta throughout all of this. And then you have the, the chain rule bit, right? If I was gonna put an eight theta here, the, the sort of outside function still gonna go from tangent to secant squared. So that bit's still, still fine. But if I would take the derivative of the tangent of eight theta, I would have had to multiply by eight. I don't want that eight to show up in my derivative. So to start, I'd have to have a one over eight here so that when I use the chain rule, the one over eight gets canceled. Does that make sense? Okay. In fact, like, any integral where you have like f prime of x times mx plus b, that's going to be f of mx plus b over m and a constant. That slope, because of the chain rule bit, if I would take the derivative of this, I would want to multiply by m because of the chain rule. And so the m and the m would cancel and I wouldn't have a constant out here, right? So if you have any sort of a linear function inside of a function that you're, you have the derivative of, you can undo that differentiation just by sort of undoing the chain rule with dividing by the slope. Questions on that one or other questions we want to talk about? Verify the formula.
What are our options? I'm pretty sure that's just the definition of antiderivative. If it wants us to verify that an integral is something, well, that's the antiderivative is something. I could just take the derivative of the natural log bit, which is going to be one over this stuff times the derivative of that, which is seven. So the derivative of this stuff is that. So that's just definition of antiderivative. Um, okay. So if we want to use that idea, if we can show that the derivative of ln of the absolute value of seven x plus 10 is equal to well, so if I take the antiderivative is equal to this thing, then the derivative is equal to the thing that's inside the antiderivative. So I want to show this can be verified if I can take the derivative of the right hand side, maybe I should put a plus C on here because it has a plus C in there. And then I will put a seven divided by seven x plus 10. Okay. So if we can verify that the right hand side has a derivative, which is the inside of the antiderivative, that's what that relationship is. And we'll start by using, well, if I wanted to take the derivative of the natural log of the linear function 7x plus 10, I'd probably use the chain rule, right? Because there's an inside function and an outside function. And we're going to let the outside function uh, be natural log. And g of x is going to be the inside function, 7x plus 10. Where f of x is the outer function, g of x is the inner function. Uh, maybe it wants an absolute value here, and maybe it wants a plus C here. Probably doesn't want the plus C, or do I have something else that's messed up? Oops. There we go. Okay. Doesn't want the plus C. It's okay with the plus C up here, but not down there. Okay. Then the antiderivative of F is one over X. The antiderivative of G is seven.
and thus f prime is seven over seven x plus 10. Did I do that wrong? Is x by g of x. Oh, it doesn't want the multiplication bit yet. Okay, yep. Okay. And so the whole derivative, now we can put the seven over in there. And then why is the verification of the given formula complete? Well, this is just the antiderivative thing, right? If the derivative of the big function is the little function, then the antiderivative of the little function is the big function. That's just what this is saying, right? These other ones are that this is the chain rule. This is the addition of antiderivatives or the addition of derivatives. This is the derivative of the product rule. But this is the one where we get to say the derivative of the antiderivative is the derivative. If you have a function, the derivative of the antiderivative of that function is the function, right? That's what that is. Yeah. Questions about that? Okay. Other things from 4.8 you guys want to talk about? Okay, with the test Monday, do you guys want to review a little bit? Do you have questions for other sections in this chapter? Optimization? Yeah. Okay, so an optimization review. Um, back earlier in the section, we found maxes and mins by finding possible critical points and that sort of stuff, right? So um, on a closed interval, a continuous function, has both a maximum and a minimum. And those are absolute. Um, the places these can be uh, when the function is differentiable. are places the derivative are zero. Or endpoints of the interval. Okay, so for example, I have a function, here's A, here's B. So this is our closed interval. The function does weird stuff. Okay, so if I'm looking for maxes and mins, 
inside this area. What am I going to do? I'm going to look at the endpoints, check here, check here, and then I'm going to check at any place where the function has a horizontal tangent line. So I need to check there, check there, check in there. Okay. So if it's horizontal, that means the slope went from up to back down, or maybe it stopped going up for a little while and then went up again. So maybe it's not a max or a min, but it, it paused in its up down motion for a little bit when I have a derivative of zero. That pause could have been a switch from going up to going down, or it could have just been a pause in going up or a pause in going down. Okay. Could have been a switch from going down to going up as well. But those are the places that we need to check. Okay, and so that sort of takes care of a big variety of functions that we deal with because most of the functions that you've seen in the past only deal with one variable, either f of x type functions or f of t type functions where you have a single input and then you get an output and that function describes something. But then later in this chapter, we talked about functions in more than one variable, um, sort of like uh, volume or surface area functions. And in more than one variable, I have a function in terms of x and y. We would like to reduce to the one variable case. Since we've kind of decided that that's easy and we can take care of that because all I have to do is figure out where this derivative is zero and then check the two endpoints as well. Okay. And to do that, we need a constraint that relates the two variables together. So if I can relate X and Y, I can find an equation with X and Y, which means I could probably solve for one of them in terms of the other. And then after I solve for one of them in terms of the other, I replace that one in here with a function of the other. And then this function just turns into a single variable function because everything's in terms of whichever variable um, I didn't solve for. I solved for one and replaced it. That means that's the one that goes away, right? I have that one in terms of the other one. So the one that I have it in terms of sticks around. And so after we do that, we can just do our regular calculus, take a derivative, check the endpoints, check places where the function might be undefined or check places, not the function undefined, check places where the derivative might be undefined. And that allows us to maximize everything. Okay, so let's maybe do an example. Um, some of the simple examples, do they have you do any like fence problem? Okay, yeah. Okay, so let's say I want to have a garden and I want to keep rabbits out of the garden. And so along my house, which has a long straight wall in the backyard, so no weird stuff going on there. I'm gonna put up a fence, which is rectangular. And in the garden, I wanna separate my flowers with another fence and like my vegetables from another fence. And maybe I just want three, three different partitions. Maybe flowers go here. Uh, like root vegetables go in here and then above ground vegetables go over here, something like that, I don't know. 
we want three pieces. And I know I have uh, two packs of fencing, fencing from Home Depot or Menards in this case, since I think Menards is in town and Home Depot isn't. And they have, let's say, 100 feet of fencing a piece. How do I maximize the area of the garden? Minimizing it would be easy, right? I just draw a straight line with a third of the fence, and then I do this one again, and then I do this one again, and then I do a fourth of the fence. I have four fences, and then I just put like a really short panel there, and there's hardly any area in that thing, but I've used up all my fence. That's kind of a dumb way to do a fence, and so we don't want to minimize the area of the garden. We actually want to maximize the area of the garden. Okay, so how do I how do I do that? Well. I don't have any variables in my picture yet, and I need to come up with an objective function. What's the function that I want to maximize or minimize? What's the thing that I'm trying to optimize? So the objective function the one that we're trying to actually get the biggest or the smallest thing out of is the area. And so I have to come up with some variables that give me the area as a function. And because this is rectangular, I'm just gonna go X and Y, right? That's the easiest way to do the area. So it's gonna be a function of X and Y and it's gonna equal X times Y. Okay. I also, have this constraint because if I'm trying to maximize this two variable function, it's kind of hard to do. We don't know how to do it. We only know how to deal with one variable functions. So I'd like to get rid of one of the variables. I need a constraint of some sort. What am I constrained by in my fencing problem? Yeah, I only have 200 feet of fence to work with, right? So that's part of the constraint. We're constrained by Two hundred feet of fence, and so what does can two hundred feet constrain in terms of the variables x and y? Yeah. So two hundred has got to be at most four x plus y. If I'm trying to maximize this area function it makes sense that I use up as much fencing as possible, right? There's not really any reason for us not to use up all the fence because if I add more fence to it, it should give me more area. So even though we could write this constraint with an inequality, really we're just thinking about this. We're gonna use up all the stuff that we possibly can, okay? And so we get that 200 equals four X plus Y. The one that's easy to solve for is y, so I'm going to solve for y as 200 minus 4x. And then in my area problem, I'm going to get the area of x comma 200 minus 4x, which is x times 200 minus 4x. And we can factor out a 4. I can get a 25 minus X. So this is, well, I guess I'm gonna to wanna to take a derivative of this. I probably don't wanna use the product rule. So let's just multiply it all out. I end up with 200 X minus four X squared, right? And that's A in terms of X just by itself. I can maximize this. Right. It doesn't make any sense uh, for my length, my x value to be 
So it doesn't make any sense for my X value to be negative. And it doesn't make any sense for my X value to be say bigger than 50, right? Because if I make it 50, I've used up all the fence. So I'm in this case, right? This would be the X equals 50 case. And if I just put a line of fence along the wall with zero length dividers, this would be the X equals zero case, right? Where I have 200 feet of fence just along the side of the house, which is also pretty dumb for a garden. Okay, so our, our domain is X being in zero to 50 because those are the two things that give me the absurdities of the actually having a fence. I mean, I still have a fence if I have zero feet of fence and that I don't even have a fence at all because I don't have any idea what negative X would mean, right? And if I have more than 50 feet in the dividers, I don't have enough feet left over to make the, the other side of the fence. So these are kind of the absurd extremes. So I will check these two endpoints and I will check where the derivative is zero, a prime of X equals zero at uh, 200 minus eight X equal to zero, right? There's my derivative, I set it equal to zero, which implies that uh, X equals uh, 12 and a half. No, 50, 25, 25. I divided by 16, 25. X equals 25, okay. So 25, 25, 25, 25, and then 100. Those would be the dimensions of my fence. And I can get that by well, we decided that y was equal to 200 minus 4x, which is equal to 100 in this case. So we can have this fence. I didn't tell you where the dividers were. Maybe I put a, like a small divider there and I got rid of this divider, but I still have three pieces that put into. I still could figure out where I want those no matter what, but no matter where I put them, I'm gonna have the maximum area and still have the three partitions of the garden. Okay, questions on that optimization problem. I talked a lot about my thought process through it, but maybe that's good, maybe that was too much. Is that good for short review on optimization? Other things that you want to talk about. I guess I didn't prove that this was the maximum. We should still check the endpoints, but I talked about why these endpoints are not the maximums already. So we don't really need to check them because we already did. But, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a lot like last time, I think, time wise. I'm not going to try and make it any longer. Um, Again, I don't know how to get my lab math to make it show up before it like actually opens. So it will open. I'll have it up. So it's set to open at like 7:45, so that you guys can log in at 7:45 and start it, and then we'll be due at 8:50. And I'll have a I'll have assignment up on Canvas that you'll be able to see beforehand. Turn in your scratch work and stuff. I think I forgot to do that last time. So I'll do that this time. Uh, I was going to look and see if I thought there was anything that was particularly 
difficult in chapter four that we should maybe review. We talked about extreme values already. Um, what's the mean value theorem say? What's the picture look like that I can draw for the mean value theorem? It's going to be a graph. Yeah. Yep. If I have a closed interval from A to B, and I have a continuous function on that interval. Continuous on the entire interval, differentiable on the inside of the interval. Then, if I draw this secant line, it is parallel to the graph at some point. So if I draw another parallel line to that here, there's this point where the derivative of that point is equal to the slope of the secant line between A and B. There is a C. In a, B, with F prime at C equal to F of B minus F of A divided by B minus A, i.e. B minus A times F prime at C is equal to F of B minus F of A. Or F of B is equal to F of A plus F prime at C times B minus A. This form is nice as well. Um, if I want to get from F of A to F of B, I can follow the slope of some point between B and A uh, and go the A of B minus A difference. This kind of looks like uh, the point slope form of an equation, except for the slope is some point that's between A and B. This form is useful in proving things in calculus. Um, not that we do a lot of that, but that's that's a very useful form in in calculus. Uh, really, the geometric idea is that the secant line has a slope which is obtained someplace in the interval. There is some c value in the interval that has the same slope as the secant. Uh, so if I'm driving to Lincoln, which let's say is 120 miles away, uh, roughly that anyway, and let's say I get there in uh, say I get there in 90 minutes. What's the maximum speed that you can confirm that I was going at? Uh, 
All right, so I'm going 120 miles in one and a half hours. So that means I'm going 240 miles in three hours, which means I was going 80 miles an hour at some point. Does that mean that I was speeding? Yeah, at some point I had to have been speeding, right? I could have been going like 150 for like seven miles or something to bump my average up, but at some point I was definitely speeding to get my average above the speed limit. Does that make sense? So they do this with truckers. Um, truckers are required to like keep logs of their mileage and everything. And so they can tell if a trucker is actually speeding or not doing good things on the road, spending too much time there, stuff like that. Um, so it doesn't really pay for a trucker to speed because if he gets there sooner than he is supposed to, the intermediate value, not the main, the mean value theorem says that he was actually speeding somewhere along the route. Maybe not when they saw the cops, but somewhere in there because he got there too fast. Okay, uh, what's a monotonic function? Monotonic, I don't know if I actually talked about that a little bit. It's the title of section 4.3, monotonic functions and the first derivative set. Monotonic. Where else have you heard the word monotonic used before? Have they used, heard the word monotonic used before? What about monotone? What's monotone mean? Like only one tone, right? It's sort of it's usually used with like teachers or speakers where they're not very interesting or inflective. They don't like talk louder or softer or any sort of entertainment value in their, their, their delivery. Okay, so it just means one direction, one tone. In math, it just means one direction. So uh, a monotonic function is a function that's only going in one direction, either only going up or only going down. It's not increasing and then decreasing and then increasing again. So monotonic functions are always increasing or always decreasing. Um, monotonic functions can sort of flatten out for a while and still be monotonic if it's strictly monotonic, just like strict inequalities means it has to strictly go up and strictly go down. And there's no like pauses. So monotone, monotone. monotonic functions. Uh, F is monotonically increasing if whenever X is less than Y, f of x is less than f of y. And I'll let it be equal for the monotonic increasing. Strictly takes out the inequality. Strictly replaces less than or equal to with less than. So if my input is less than this input, then the output was less than this output, right? That means that this function is moving up as I move to the right. Decreasing flips the inequality, right? Decreasing. X less than Y implies F of X is bigger than or equal to F of Y. So if my input is smaller than this input, then this output was bigger than this output. It means I'm going downhill. Okay. And then the strictly again takes the the less than or equal to and just make the less than. 
so when it's talking about monotonic functions, it's just talking about like, if I have a di differentiable function and I find the critical points, the function is gonna be monotonically increasing on this interval, right? Increasing on that interval. We have a plus derivative there. The only places that the function can change from being monotonically increasing to monotonically decreasing are critical points or points where the derivative is undefined. Right. And this was the this was the section we talked all about um, intervals of increase, intervals of decrease, that type of stuff. In this interval, it is strictly increasing because the derivative is strictly positive. So this is strictly monotonically increasing on this entire interval. It is strictly monotonically decreasing on this entire interval. It is strictly monotonically increasing on this entire interval because I don't have any place where the derivative is zero, so it doesn't flatten out anywhere. There's no point where if x is bigger than y, f of x is equal to f of y. There's none of that sort of flatness in here okay. so that's that's what that section was about uh what does concavity tell us about functions and how do we measure concavity it can tell you if your if the if the first derivative there is concave down right concave down you'll have a maximum where the first derivative was zero, right? If it's concave up, you'll have a minimum where the first derivative is zero. So concavity can tell you which you have, a maximum or a minimum. But what it tells you is, is it curving down or is it curving up, right? Is the, is the graph sort of rolling over or sort of rapid, ramping up type deal, right? And how do we tell what type of concavity we have? Second derivative. F double prime uh, tells us the concavity. And negative means rolling down, positive, ramping up, right? So the first derivative starts out negative and turns to positive, right? Negative slope positive slope. So through this period, it went from negative to positive. So the change in the slope was positive. That's why you get the concave up. Okay. Here, negative slope, I'm sorry, that's positive slope goes to negative slope. Okay. Positive slope, negative slope. So the sec the change in the slope is from positive to negative. That means that the rate of change of slope is negative. Right? It's decreasing through there. Uh, then we use Le Hapital's rule, which just lets us compute some more limits using derivatives. Kind of a nice tool. Um, we did some optimization stuff, which we talked about a little bit, and then we did Newton's method stuff, and then we talked about antiderivatives. I don't think there's a lot of terribly deep results in this section. There's some useful stuff, but nothing that I think really takes effort to wrap your head around thoroughly. Um, there's some nice procedural things to do. But I think it was kind of a fairly straightforward chapter and what it was asking for. Um, some of the technical details on how to actually compute Newton's method and use it, those were maybe a little bit tricky, but the method itself, I don't think, is sort of super esoteric. Questions about any of that stuff before? I'll let you guys go today. Okay, 
uh, come with questions for review tomorrow. Um, and we'll go through anything you guys want to talk about tomorrow. Uh, we can go through some more of the homework from 4.8, or we can go through older homework, anything you guys want to talk about. So that you guys can study over the weekend for the test on Monday. Um, I won't be in here Monday. You can take the test from home. You can come here to take the test if you want to, but I won't be there. I will see you guys tomorrow, though.